Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Museum's Night TV studio and another edition of Inside Media. I'm your host, John Maynard. On August 2nd, 2007, journalist Chauncey Bailey was shot to death on his way to work at the Oakland Post, a weekly newspaper serving the black communities of the San Francisco Bay Area. The motive behind Bailey's murder was simple, to stop a story that he was working on. Uh, with this blatant attack on the First Amendment, Bailey became the first journalist in a generation who was murdered in the United States for doing his job. Uh, Bailey was working on a story to expose a local business known as Your Black Muslim Bakery that fronted for an organized crime operation led by the man who would ultimately be found guilty of ordering Bailey's murder. Uh, the new book, Killing the Messenger, a story of radical faith, racism's backlash, and the assassination of a journalist uh, chronicles the events leading to Bailey's murder uh, and charts the trajectory of the Oakland crime family uh, that led to Bailey's death. We are joined today by the author of the book, Thomas Peel. Uh, Thomas is a digital investigative reporter for the Bay Area News Group uh, and the Chauncey Bailey Project. He is also a lecturer at UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. His many honors include the Investigative Reporters and Editors Tom Renner Award for reporting on organized crime and the McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Thomas Peel. So Thomas, let me, let me start by just asking you what prompted you to uh, want to investigate Chauncey Baylor's murder. Well, I mean, imagine a reporter killed over a story right. and that chilling effect on the potential of other reporters. Right. You know, that said, there was a template for this kind of work, this type of response when a journalist was killed, and that was the Ari legendary Arizona Project right. in the response to Don Bowles' death. So, when it was very quickly learned that Bailey was killed by members of an organization on whom he was working on a story, um, that prompted college students, journalism professors, working reporters, nonprofit journalism administrators to gather pretty quickly and start in on this project of, of digging into his the murder and the organization behind it. Right. He was killed in August of 2007. When did the Chauncey Bailey Project uh, kind of really form? You know, I think the first organizational meeting, which I didn't attend, was a few weeks later. Um, I mean, it moved fairly quickly. There was, again, the Arizona Project was the, was the perfect template for this. And there was also a sense of duty among journalists that there really wasn't much of a choice here, that this work had to be done, it had been done before when Mr. Bowles was killed, right. and that it fell to us that we were going to have to look into this very deeply and send the classic message that you can't kill a story by killing a reporter. Right. Well, let's talk about uh, a little bit about Chauncey Bailey himself, sure. um, and we, we do have a picture of him that uh, we will put up on the screens. Um, give us a little background on, him, on Bailey, um, sure. his career arc, I mean, before coming to the Oakland Post, which is a relatively small newspaper, I mean, he was a reporter at some much mm -hmm. larger newspapers, correct? Now, let me start by answering that, John, by quoting something that Lyndon Johnson once said after Kennedy's death when he went to speak to the Congress, and that is, I would give everything I have not to be here today. Mm. And in, in that sense, I didn't know Chauncey Bailey. I never met him. My book isn't a biography of him, but I'm probably the closest thing he has to a biographer. And if he wasn't killed, a good man, a good father to his son, it would be great not to be here. But these are the facts that we deal with. Right. And he was a career newspaper man. Um, a highlight of his career was 12 or 13 years covering City Hall in Detroit for the Detroit News when it was a two newspaper town with thriving newspapers. Um, before that, he had worked for the Hartford Current. Um, he had attended, in fact, he ended up there after working for a small weekly African-American newspaper in San Francisco, and he left there to go to a minority summer journalism program at Columbia. Mm -hmm. He was recruited to the Hartford Current. He went to the Hartford Current. He went to UPI. He spent a brief period of time here in Washington as a congressional press secretary, and then went to Detroit. In Detroit, he went home to Oakland, right. worked for a radio station for a year and went to the Oakland Tribune and covered African-American affairs 
uh, for about 10 years, and he was um, terminated there. He was fired for ethical violations. Mm. And he landed on his feet in June of 2007 at the Oakland Post, another small African-American newspaper, very much going full circle, right. to be its editor. Right. And two months later, he was working on this story. Right. He cared a lot about Oakland, though, obviously. He did care a yeah. lot about Oakland. He was, I, I describe him in the book at one point as a, as a journalistic dray horse. Back when newspapers were robust, we all remember the days when there was such a thing as a news hole to fill. Mm -hmm. And he was one of these reporters who could go out every day and find a story. He was never lacking for a 12 or a 15 inch daily story off his beat to help editors fill up the newspaper. Right. And that was really his journalistic strength. He wasn't an investigative reporter, he wasn't a great digger, but if you needed 15 inches on something and you needed it fast, he was the guy who could get it to you. Right. Um, I want to talk about the other big part of the story, of course, and that is the, the Bay family, sure. uh, which uh, really had a stranglehold over the city of Oakland uh, with the bakery. How, how did the family gain such prominence in the city? You know, in the early 1970s, the founder of this organization, Yusef Bay, broke from the Nation of Islam. He no longer wanted to be a part of its structure, mm -hmm. but he wanted to practice the same belief system. And effectively, what he wanted from that was the money. Mm. The money in the Nation of Islam, as historians have shown, flowed up to Chicago to the family of Elijah Muhammad, its leader. Bay didn't want any part of that. He wanted his own organization. And over time, he made that organization powerful through intimidation. And it really, he raised that level in 1994, when of all things, he ran for mayor of Oakland in a very crowded primary field, and he got 5% of the vote. Not very much, but enough to make him a bit of a power broker, a perception that he spoke for a certain constituency. That allowed him to trade on that and win political favors from people. He then began to sell the baked goods from his, uh, from his company in public venues, winning public contracts. Four years later, Jerry Brown, now the governor of California, was running for Oakland mayor. And there was a meeting. And effectively, Bay brokered a deal. He wouldn't run. The city would kind of leave him alone, let him do his own thing. And mm. it, it cascaded from there. Right, right. And now you, let's get to the, you know, the, the murder itself, Yusuf sure. Bay IV. Mm -hmm. And that's not fourth generation, but that's actually his fourth child. I say that. Yeah. Um, Yusuf Bey the Elder had a bit of George Foreman in him. He named five sons after himself. Right. This happened to be the fourth. Right, right. Um, and, and the fourth was ultimately the one, without giving too much away in the book, of course, that uh, was charged with uh, ordering the kill. What's, you know, what was the ultimate motive? Why, why did you know, fourth go after Bailey? The ultimate motive was to silence Bailey because Bailey was working on a story. Again, sort of a classic Chauncey Bailey story. 15, 20 inch story about the bakery being in bankruptcy. Not a revelation. Mm -hmm. um, it had been reported before, mm -hmm. but he was gonna write about it for the Oakland Post in his new job as that newspaper's editor. But there was also something else. There was retribution, and it speaks to Yusuf Bay IV's demented mindset. Um, when Bailey was at the Oakland Post, Yusuf Bay the Elder had been charged in a very heinous sex crime case mm -hmm. where that, that caused his collapse. Um, he was a polygamist. He had a lot of women in the bakery that he dubbed his spiritual wives, including some of whom who were 13 and 14 years old. And 20 years later, it was proven with DNA that he had had sexual relations with girls who were 13 and 14 years old. And he was eventually arrested and tried of course, he was dying of AIDS at the time, and he was never convicted, but there was a series of court proceedings. Chauncey covered those for the Oakland Tribune. Mm. Very boilerplate, go to court, write what happens stories. But in Forth's mind, his father was God, mm. and his father was entitled to do to Forth whatever he wished, including impregnate these young girls. So they, the Bays viewed the charges as slander, and they viewed Chauncey's stories in the Oakland Tribune as slanderous. A few days before the murder, Forth was watching with a group of his guys 
a videotape of his father's funeral. Right. Chauncey covered the funeral. Camera pans, stops it. There's Chauncey on the screen on this mm -hmm. video, and Forth says, that's the blankety blank who killed my dad right there. Mm -hmm. And it later came out in testimony at his trial that that retribution, in addition to silencing him, was a big deal. Now, he thought that the stories that Chauncey did added to stress on his father mm -hmm. that hastened his death. It's a rather bizarre theory, but that's kind of where he was. Right. Um, one, another big part of this book, really, is that you, you delve into uh, quite a, a comprehensive history of, of, mm -hmm. of the black Muslim movement uh, from its foundings to the, to the heights of its power with Elijah Muhammad. Uh, why did you feel that you needed to go into so much depth on that for, 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 this, for this book? I wanted to get to the bottom of the belief system. I wanted to explain to readers where the black Muslim movement came from. And it was also, you know, it was widely known in Oakland that Yusuf Bey, while being powerful and getting dozens of followers, was also, he was kind of mocked mm. for, you know, he had a, for a TV show that he had on once a week in which he, um, you know, blared from the pulpit for an hour. And I really wanted to get to the, to the bottom of it and understand where those specific beliefs came from. Right. Um, which is why I went back and looked even at its, the Nation of Islam's forerunner, the more science temple of America. Right, right. Yeah. Um, it, how did our, our Orthodox Islam differ you know, from the religion practiced at your black Muslim bakery? Well, the religion that was practiced at your black Muslim bakery is best described as Farardian Islam, which um, was founded by a man named W.D. Farad. And he was a con man. He was a huckster. He had um, immigrated to California from Afghanistan, kind of hopping across the British Empire in Asia. Um, and he ended up in San Quentin in the mid-1920s. And he got out, he went to Chicago, and then he went to Detroit. And in Detroit, he began to work the ghetto. And he began to tell people in the ghetto that he was there to save them. He had come from Mecca, um, and that eventually he would claim to them to be God. And he was telling people that their true religion was not Christianity, it was Islam. But it was his version of Islam, which included facts like, or facts that he foisted on people, like Caucasians and Jews are devils who were created by a mad scientist through grafting experiments. He um, constantly spoke of a pending or coming apocalypse that would be launched from a spaceship circling the earth that only he and his top followers could see in the night sky. Had very little to do with Orthodox Islam. Right, right. Hardly anything. Yeah. And what was life like inside the bakery? Obviously the bakery did some good things uh, in terms of their promoting the, the health food and whatnot, but, right. but what else, what other kind of things went on? Well, Bay really turned that bakery, that organization into a polygamous cult inside an urban compound. He took in poor women who had no place else to go, gave them jobs, gave them shelter, um, but he was a vociferous sexual predator. Um, he didn't merely father children with his flock. He was notorious for beating and abusing these women. Um, and they lived in a great deal of fear for their lives, for crossing him. In 1986, a man who worked at the bakery walked in on Bay raping a young boy in a restroom. He ran out of the restroom and he blurted to some people what he had just seen. Within 36 hours, he was shot dead. His murder was never solved, mm -hmm. but it sent a message to everybody inside that organization that they were just, this is what happens if you talk about what goes on here. Right. It was an absolutely horrible existence for these women. Um, as you de detail in the book, the fourth, you know, clearly uh, ordered the, the murder on, on Chauncey Bailey, mm -hmm. but he, the fourth was pretty close to going free on this, on this charge. You know, he was. He was not indicted uh, for more than a year and a half. Okay. And after the murder, he was arrested on another felony case. He had a long string of, of felonies going on. He was arrested for kidnapping a woman and torturing her. Um, he came very close to a decision by the district attorney not to charge him in that case for a lack of concrete evidence. Mm. 
Um, so he was fairly close right after his arrest to walking away from this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have uh, the, one of the main accomplishments from the Chauncey Bailey project was mm -hmm. uncovering uh, some damning video, um, which essentially shows Bay in, in a holding room, mm -hmm. secretly videotaped by the police, right. uh, bragging and laughing about his role in the murder. And that came out of this yeah. kidnapping case. Right. And they were pretty desperate when he was arrested to get more evidence in this kidnapping case. Mm -hmm. And they took kind of a bit of a, you know, a football analogy, kind of a Hail Mary, mm -hmm. where they tricked him into thinking that the car, a police car transporting him to a court appearance had a flat tire, took him into a police station with two of his followers and said, you guys wait here in this room while we change the tire. Mm -hmm. Well, the room was wired for sound and video cameras. And all three of these guys were involved in that kidnapping. So the first thing that they did was all kind of hunker down and right. say to each other, wow, what a great break we've got. We get to talk for a minute. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's very transparent what police were doing. And the first thing they said was, OK, we'll keep out of it this way. We've got to keep our story straight about this kidnapping. Right. And right there, he was gone on the kidnapping case. But then they let the camera run for an hour, and he made a lot of comments about Bailey's murder. He didn't say anything that directly implicated himself in ordering it, but he laughed about it, he mocked it, he talked about the gun that he had, he talked about the fact that he had, the assassin had given him the gun back, and then 12 hours later he had given the gun back to the assassin to go on guard duty. Um, and we got a hold of that videotape um, from a source San Francisco Chronicle, in fact, had it first, but they didn't have the time to analyze it that we did, and they went in another direction with it. We took it and really worked it down for about a six-week period to get at it mm -hmm. and to get, the, to get the poignant things about Bailey's murder out, and we put it on the Internet. Right, right. Um, one of the, the, this book is also somewhat of an indictment of the, the, the Oakland Police Department. I know you're... You're an Oakland resident. Yep. Uh, tell us about some of the ways they bum bungled the case. Uh, well, certainly when, uh, uh, the, tell us about the yeah. two-day vacation. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the irony is that a kidnapping case was coupled with a couple of other crimes. Fourth had ordered two other men killed in the weeks before Bailey's assassination. And police were on a rather slow pace investigating those two murders and then they joined with the kidnapping investigation and they reached a point where they said okay we're gonna go in there we're gonna raid this place right. and the raid was scheduled for August 1st 2007 and it was a militaristic operation it was a no-knock warrant which means they just go up and bust the doors down right. um, you can do it at five o'clock in the morning with 200 cops because they feared this organization greatly the problem is or was that the SWAT commander and another high-ranking officer were on vacation. And the police chief decided that since they were on vacation, they should wait for them to come back. And at the last minute, there was a two-day delay. It was in that two-day period that Bailey was killed. If they'd gone in on August 1st, we wouldn't be here. Mm. They'd, be the, they'd just be a little footnote to, to history because they would have gone down on these other crimes. Right. From there, the police department um, they went in on those warrants and they found the kid who shot Bailey in possession of the shotgun. Took him in, he wouldn't confess. They literally brought forth into the room with him and used him to try to pressure the kid to confess at that moment, which he didn't do, which was a very high stakes game for, the, for, for Fourth especially because at any moment, this kid, his name was Devondre Broussard, could have blurted out, well, he told me to do it. Right. Then they both would have gone. But that didn't happen. And then the police had this moment where they decided, well, we should leave these two guys alone together. Fourth, uh, Broussard said, let me, let me talk to him for a minute. And they did it. And this was in a room, unlike the other, that wasn't wired for sound. Right. After that seven-minute period, Broussard confessed to the murder. A very flawed confession because he said he acted alone. He it was his own enterprise. He heard about this story, and he was going to go kill this reporter on his own to improve his standing in this organization. Um, and that effectively ended the murder investigation. Mm. 
they didn't look it forth for a long time, um, despite the fact that it was painfully obvious that no one within the bakery did anything without his order and approval. I want to see if there's any questions. Uh, if, if you do have a question, please, uh, please raise your hand and, and we'll have, we do have, a, looks like we have a question on the second row there. Uh, before we get to the question, I want to just ask you a quick question about sure. the, the story ever run. Uh, the, the Bailey, Bailey had submitted a story to the publisher, correct? Of the right, and it, it didn't run. The publisher sent it back for more attribution. I'm one of the few people who's read that story. Okay. Um, it wasn't incredibly well written. Right. And it did need some work. The problem is the Open Post ran a lot of stories that weren't incredibly well written. Right. And it really was that the publisher of the paper was quite aware of who the Bays were mm -hmm. and was leery about, about running it. He was afraid of them right. with reason. Right. Sir. Uh, can you talk about the reporter's family and the reporter's son? What, what is, how old is his son and mm -hmm. what is he doing now? Sure. Um, his son lives in Southern California. Um, I, he, he took his father's death, as you can imagine, very, very hard. They were, they were quite close. Um, Chauncey wasn't married to, the, to his son's mother. They didn't live in the same town, but they visited a lot. And he was very, very committed to being the best father that he could be at a distance to his son. He, he believed in that very much. Um, he had a uh, former wife in Detroit, sister in Atlanta, a couple of brothers, um, no other children. Um, they were just absolutely devastated by all this, as you, as you can imagine. I've never met the son, Chauncey III. Um, I understand he's doing a little bit better now, um, but he took it very, very hard. I, we have a, a journalist memorial here. Oh, we have a question there. Uh, if you could bring it up there. And <clears throat> it gets to a question about, uh, we have 2,000 names on our journalist memorial of journalists worldwide who've been killed since 1837. Mm -hmm. um, the death of Chauncey Bailey come 25 years after Don Bowles. How rare is it for a, a well, journalist in the United States as, you, as, as compared as, to the world? Well, yeah. you know, yeah. compared to the world, unfortunately, yep. we see that the world, parts of the world are a very dangerous yep. place, yep. be it Syria, be it um, Juarez, right. but here, you know, nothing domestically since Bailey was killed, nothing, that gap between Don Bowles and Bailey, um, but I don't know that we're necessarily, you know, safe, that it, that it won't happen to another right. reporter. Yeah, and that's an impossible question to answer, but could right. it happen again? Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, you see is there are groups like ba the Bays that, it, that exist as long as there are, you know, are impoverished and radicalized people who don't want to be reported on. Mm -hmm. We could certainly see this again. Sure. Sir. Uh, in, uh, along those lines, you mentioned that the publisher was already uh, intimidated by the family and, and mm -hmm. obviously others were in the community. Um, was there, uh, did they, ha were there other members of the press that they had intimidated or, or done things to mm -hmm. in the past and also in the, in the year and a half that it took before there was an indictment, I think he said, how much was there attempts to try to, you know, intimidate you and the other journalists who sure. were interested in this in the story? Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little about that? There's a very good alternative paper in Oakland, the East Bay Express, and in 2002, a reporter named Chris Thompson did a couple of very excellent exposés on the bakery, knocking down the facades that Yusuf Bey the Elder had um, built around himself. And for that, the newspaper's windows were smashed out. Um, Thompson received threats, and he went into hiding for a while. He left Oakland. Um, when we started our work and began to push toward this goal of having everyone held accountable for Bailey's murder who was involved in it. We really didn't get any intimidation from members of the organization. At that point, it was, it was defunct. The family still exists, mm -hmm. and there are, there are followers around, but there was no you know, core to it. So we, we never had any threats. I will say that a colleague of mine who works for the Oakland Tribune, Josh Richmond, um, was working on a story about 
a guy who had been at the bakery as a member, who was involved in some real estate fraud, and he picked up the phone one day and voice said to him, you write that story, you're going to end up like your friend Chauncey. Um, no one was arrested for that. It was investigated. No one was arrested. Um, but you know, that threat had to be taken very seriously. Question right there, sir. Um, were there ever any, any charges or investigations brought around the, uh, uh, you know, the molestation and of, of minors? Hmm. You know, there was. Um, and what happened was that one of these teenage girls who had had a daughter by Yusef Bey watched that daughter grow up and become quite troubled as an adolescent. And the mother instinctively knew what was going on, that this poor girl was being raped by her father. And it took the mother a while to draw that out, to get that admission. And as soon as she did, her fear vanished because now she was a mother who had to protect, protect her child. So she went immediately into the police department and asked to speak to a detective. And she said, I was raped, my sister was raped, my daughter's being raped. And the sex crime unit did a great job. They, um, I mean, they had to go back on something that was almost 20 years old mm -hmm. to prove it. They used birth certificates that showed that Bay denied paternity to these children. Then they got a search warrant, tracked down the children, took DNA, got a search warrant for Bay, took his DNA, and there it was. Scientific evidence that he was the father of these children. He was arrested. Um, another victim came forward. And he was quite sick at the time. He was dying. And while he, he was never convicted, it never got to a trial, never got to a plea. And that allowed for a while his followers after his death to say he was never convicted. That was, just, that was a conspiracy to, to, to ruin him. There was, no, there was no truth to it. And ironically enough, even the people who were saying that included one of the sons who was, whose mother was 14 years old when he was born. It kind of goes to the, to the depravity that he brought to the entire organization in that way. Hmm. I mean, but the, you know, the scientific evidence is pretty ironclad, even though it never got to a jury. And I'll just have one last follow-up question uh, to that gentleman's question. Sure. Since the book has come out, uh, which came out in February of this year, you've made a lot of uh, appearances in, in the Bay Area. Sure. What's been the response? Have you, you, know, have you had any confrontations? Or? No, no, the response yeah. has been great. There are, uh, a couple of guys came uh, who were a little tangential to the bakery, came to my mm -hmm. first book reading and, and made a couple of loud remarks in the back of the room, but that was it. Yeah. There's, 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 there's no threats left. Right, right. So again, I, I welcome you all to, to do visit the Chauncey Bailey exhibit um, on the, uh, the fifth floor. If there are no other questions, uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, Thomas will be signing books right outside the studio, and he'll also can take any follow-up questions you, you may have for that. So thank you for joining us today at Inside Media and enjoy the rest of your day at the museum. Thank, thank you. you.